So convert stuttering. Um, in its basic form, basically it means doing anything to hide your stutter. And some examples of that are substituting words, uh, circumlocution, or going around a word, filler words such as um, uh, or like. I'm guilty of that. I live in California, so that's baked into our language. Uh, <laughs> and maybe for some of you out there as well, um, <laughs> there is a um just like that. Avoidance. So if you're speaking to someone one-on-one -on -one or in a group, you may not speak at all because you're afraid of stuttering or you may not want to stutter. That can also extend out to avoidance as in avoiding a situation altogether. So some coverts uh, will do that as well. And just like other people who stutter, we all have secondaries. So we can use hand movements as we're talking that can help us avoid a stutter completely <laughs> or hide a stutter. We can make hand gestures. Um, we can look away when we feel like we get a chance just to kind of recharge ourselves and get ready for the conversation or, or to continue it. So those are some examples. Without further ado, I'll kick it over to Holly and she can start us off. All right. Um, thank you so much for hosting this, LJ and Kathy, and thank you for the opportunity to be on the panel. Um, I am also a mother of a child that stutters. Um, so I feel like I kind of check all those boxes. I am a person that stutters. I'm a speech path and my son stutters too. Um, so I started stuttering around four or five. I was in um, public school speech therapy. Um, a middle school speech pathologist told my mom that she's not comfortable treating a person that stutters. So she gave my mom a flyer she got in the mail and it was about an intensive um, fluency management clinic. It was at the University of South Florida. So as a freshman going into high school, I attended that intensive fluency management clinic. It was a three week um, clinic and it basically taught you easy onset. Um, so I begged my mom to not put me back in speech therapy in high school. Um, and that's kind of my speech therapy background, um, being someone that stutters and receiving speech therapy. Um, I um, became a speech pathologist because I had to decide on a um, major in college and I didn't know what else to do and speech path was something I was familiar with because I attended speech therapy um, th throughout my life um, and I got halfway through the bachelor's program and learned that you have to have a master's degree in speech and so um, I just decided to keep it going. Um, I didn't have the best fluency instructor in college, and um, so that didn't give me a love to specialize in stuttering. And then part of me thought, too, I live and breathe stuttering every day personally. Um, do I want to have that kind of as a, a specialty, too? Um, so I worked in the hospitals as a speech path for five years, and now I'm a speech path in our school district. Um, so as far as my covert background, I attended my first um, NSA conference in Parsippany, New Jersey. I want to say, um, I don't know, that was maybe 2010. Um, and it was my first conference all through school to be a speech path. I never heard about the National Stuttering Association. I think I had a student on my caseload who stuttered and I didn't even know what to do. And so I Googled it and National Stuttering Association popped up and I learned about the conference. And being a covert stutterer, I thought to myself, well, Am I going to this conference and, and am I going to be a speech pathologist at this conference or am I going to be someone that stutters? Um, so because I was nervous about going and being around that many people that stuttered um, and still to this day, I prefer that my n n name tag at the NSA conferences 
um, do not say that I'm a speech path. Um, because talking to someone that stutters, as soon as they hear or see that you're a speech path, it just kind of changes things. And when I go to the NSA, I won't want to be that person who stutters and not be a um, speech path. Um, so, but I attended m my first conference and I read about the covert stuttering workshop and I thought, well, that kind of sounds interesting. So I go and I'm sitting in this workshop that Kathy and some of the other um, individuals are putting on. And I said, oh my gosh, I'm a covert stutterer. I've never heard that before. I didn't know what it was. I didn't learn about it being a speech pathologist in grad school. I had no idea. Um, and my stutter can be very m mild. Um, and that's how I can come off as covert. And I change my words all the time. Um, and one of the discussions tonight is, do we still feel like we're a covert stutter when you realize that's what you are? And when you go to NSA, that there's a big feeling of acceptance and you let your covert ways down. Um, but I feel that I have been covert longer than I have it. So um, it's very hard to get out of the habit of changing the words that I anticipate I'm going to stutter on. Um, so I would still say that I'm covert because depending on the situation, if I'm in, um, if I'm in a meeting with people that don't know I stutter and the timing isn't right to just disclose that I'm someone that stutters, I definitely still um, come off as more c covert. Attending the NSA conferences has given me acceptance to disclose it a lot more often um, and to not hide it as m much, um, but it is something that I still do. Um, and as far as my, my Family and friends have all known that I always stutter, but in school, I think I was quiet. I didn't respond to questions the teacher would ask because I didn't want to stutter in front of people that didn't know I stuttered. Um, so those are some of my covert ways as far as being um, a covert person that stutters. And I also think being a speech path is a very accepting world for someone who is a covert stutter to come out and disclose it more often and not have that feeling of rejection or those thoughts that we have in our head that could be bad, which is why we do things so we don't stutter. Um, so that's kind of my background and my journey along the way. Um, and I look forward to hearing the others. And if you guys have any questions during the Q&A too. Awesome. Thanks for sharing, Holly. Uh, up next, we have uh, Kathy. So Kathy, uh, take it away. Ooh, I'm nervous. I don't know why I'm so nervous. Um, my name is Kathy Olish Masajewski, and I'm from Gross Eel, Michigan. How many of you can say that? And I've used my hand before if someone asks where I'm from jokingly because I can't say Michigan. So just a little humor. I, I do that all, all, all the time. Um, so I've, I've stuttered as long as I could remember. Um, being that I, my family, I've never really talked to about it. My mom thinks I'm over it. So I can't really, I choose not to ask her how long I have. But as long as I could remember I have. Um, I began speech therapy in kindergarten, um, just um, a couple times a week with other people who have speech issues. I was more mild, never teased. Um, and then when I got to junior high, uh, around age 12, uh, it was embarrassing being pulled out of class for speech. And at that age, you don't want to have zits, you don't want to be different, you want to blend in. So I decided I'm not going to go anymore. And my mom thought I was over it. Around the same time, um, I lost my um, dad. My dad passed away five days before my 13th birthday. Although I typically say 12 because that's an easier number to say. Um, he was an alcoholic. So um, you can imagine there was a lot going on in our home and we never talked about it. 
we never talked about that or my, my speech or anything else. So I decided my life fell out of control. I'm going to control my speech and I'm going to just start hiding it. And that's where my journey began. In high school, I was more on the shy side, but I was friends with everybody, the popular people, the nerds, everyone. I was somewhere in the middle. I was a class clown, but you know, no one knew that I was just this, this fluent inside of me. Um, and when I got out of high school, I immediately worked. Um, my first real big job was at Ford, which I've been uh, there for 25 years already. And my first job was to answer phones. And I took about 100 calls a day and I had people train me listening to these calls for about two weeks. And here I am changing words. And I mean, I, no one knew. I didn't block one time. It was amazing. It was like, it was an out-of-body ex, ex experience. Um, and then, then um, a couple of years afterwards, I was just having a hard time. Um, so, you know, I began doing these things like with the phone. If I had to call anyone, I would make sure that when they answer the phone, rather than say, hi, this is Kathy, I'd start rambling until I knew they knew it was me. And I usually got away with not saying my name or, um, you know, those, I'd pick up the phone and cough, <laughs> sorry, and start talking. So I wouldn't have to say my name or I'd sneeze or somehow I always avoided a block by using all these tech techniques. Now I still said what I wanted to say, but um, I, I definitely uh, avoided it much. So I was at work one day and I was having just a very hard time, looked up on the web, found NSA, printed everything, put it away. Six months later, um, a girl I know, Sarah Diagas, you know, I gave her a packet and we decided to go to our first meeting together. So I emailed the chapulator, Bernie Weiner, who I miss very much. Um, and I said, I have a friend who, who, who stutters. So I wouldn't even tell him it was me too. So we show up at the meeting and it was wonderful. I mean, it was a life changer. Um, then nine months later, he got us to go to our first conference. Um, it was in Chicago, so it was nearby. So we go um, in the first couple of years, or the first year people thought I was an SLP because I was just fluent and SLPs are all over the place and they're fluent. And it was a great feeling to be there, but I didn't feel like I fit in because I wasn't blocking like these people were. And then when I got home, a couple months later, Russ Hicks um, reached out, planned a call with myself, Sarah Bell, um, Chris Roach, and said, you guys are over. And we're like, what does that mean? And that's where it was coined. He, he goes, you guys are doing a workshop. You have no options. You're doing it. So in 2000, after, uh, a year later, I did my first workshop, which was very tough just to get up there to talk to people. And I was fluent the whole time. And I came to a word, natural, which I couldn't change. And the audience kind of got the vibe that was going on. And they're yelling, they're screaming, say it, say it, say it. So I wrote it down on the board. They're still screaming, say it, say it. So I said it and I blocked very little. And then I sat down, that was done. But that was the first time I actually felt like it belonged anywhere. Um, and that began my journey with the NSA. Um, just to give you guys a few examples of um, some, some things I've, how far I've gone to have my listeners assume I'm someone who's fluent. Leaving voicemails, hit the redo, listen, redo, listen. I've spent, not so much anymore, but before I've spent up to dozens of times re-recording a message here, out of office message, same thing. One time I timed myself 23 minutes to leave a freaking out of all this message. It was ridiculous. Um, I have Nick uh, names for everyone and everything. Um, and the beauty of that is I have other friends using those same nicknames and it's, it's, it's kind of cool, um, but that's also to avoid um, uh, hearing, having them hear me block. Um, I actually went by the name Ann for a short time, not with people I knew, but if I was, calling anyone and they'd never talk to me again or in the store and they'd put something on hold, I would just use the name Anne. I did that a lot up until past about five, six years ago. So those are just a few examples of, of that. Um, and um, so it almost felt like um, 
when I went to the can, can uh, for instance, no one heard me black or, or stutter for the first four years. I wouldn't even say that word. I call it the S word or S-ing, and I hated it so much. And it wasn't until 2003, four years later, when I won the NSA Member of the Year Award that I actually said it in my speech, and it was so freeing. Um, but to me, it's more exhausting when I allow it out and block than if I don't do it. People think hiding and s switching and rephrasing is a lot of work, but it's not. When I have those days where I just, like at the con, friends are at home, if I let my blacks out, I feel exhausted. It's easier to just keep hiding and hiding and hiding. Um, so, so fast forward, I was dating my now husband and I was going with Sarah out of town to the board meeting, but I was just going on vacation with her. Um, and we, it was in Tampa, 2012. And um, uh, my husband was gonna meet his friend in Tampa that summer, so we decided to line it up at the same time. And so I sent him a long email, took weeks to write it, telling him about me. And he wrote back and said, I know, I looked you up on the web two weeks after we began dating. But it took me a couple of weeks to realize it was you because you, you, you never block around me. So, you know, all that going on, um, excuse me. Um, my current job is I work at, uh, with vice presidents and board of, board of directors and their HR contacts. So if they need anything, they call me, I meet with them all the time. And I look back after these meetings, I wonder how did I ever do that? But I go to bed early the days before, I don't eat hours before, cause I feel like I'll be more fluent. So there's a lot of tricks and techniques that I do. Sorry, too much talking. <laughs> and so where I am now, um, I have two boys and both my boys, um, daughter pretty moderately. So for the queen of covert to have two boys who, who, who stutter, it was like a lot of emotions, a lot of dealing with my own. I see them not care. So it's kind of taught me to accept myself more. Um, <coughs> um, they're six and five, so they're pretty young. Um, and it's funny, I'll go to my mom's house and once in a while she'll say, oh, I remember when you used to. And, I, you know, my husband just rolls his eyes at me like he used to. Um, but, you know, and then when other people mention it, mention my boys, I don't always own up and say I do too. I just say, well, they're in speech. And it's like, I need to get better at, I need to be better, more okay with it for them to be. Um, but um, I would never encourage anyone hiding. I do regret some things. Um, there's some friendships I missed out of. And, and I sometimes don't always say the right words. Um, an example is when my friend's boyfriend broke up with her long term. And rather than say, I'm sorry to hear that, I said, I'm sorry he dumped you because I couldn't say break up. So that was so, something. Don't always choose the wisest words. And it's just, it's being covert and being open about it is something it's, you always need to work on. Um, it's a conflict I have within myself, even if I, the few people I tell I do, I hide it no matter what. So just a journey, hard habit to break. And um, we all have our own journey and, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens next. So. Awesome. Thank you for, for sharing, Kathy. <clears throat> all right, next up is uh, me, I guess. So. <laughs> Um, so, hi everyone again. Uh, my name is LJ Jamoto. I currently work as an engineering manager. I'm a mild and a covert stutterer, and I'm also a son, a husband, a dog guardian, and a second generation Filipino American. As a stutterer, I actually, there are different words that come to mind, and the first one is I felt confused. I felt confused because when I started stuttering, it was actually at age seven. It went away at age 10, and then it came back at age 13. So that was one confusion. Why the heck did it come back? It's like I hit the lottery at 10, great, no more stuttering, and then it came back again at 13. And both times, my mom took me to see an SLP, both when I was seven and when I was 13. And both times, the SLPs told her that I never stuttered in front of them, reading, 
uh, conversing, just anything that required speaking. And so the first SLP told my mom if she thought there was something wrong to go and just read books aloud, out loud with me at home. And so that's what we did. We read for an hour a day out loud from second to fifth grade. Um, and I felt uneasy. I felt uneasy because while my mom was patient with my stutter, it was always towards fixing it. And while I read with my dad, I was not allowed to stutter. In fact, I got, he, he would get mad and I would get uh, penalized for it. One more minute added onto the clock. So 61 minutes, 62 minutes and so forth. And so home mostly wasn't a safe place. I had to figure out how to hide it there for an hour every day. In school, I felt neglected. Um, my second grade teacher is actually on tonight where I first started stuttering. Hey, Ms. Sussman, good to see you. Um, I remember when I first stuttered, my classmates were holding up uh, poster boards in front of the class and it was just a routine thing for us. I would get up and I would read these poster boards and go sit back down. And one day I was on the first sentence and on the fourth word I blocked and I couldn't get anything out. And I just remember, I don't remember if the class left out, I think they did. Usually they always did. And I cried and I walked outside and I stood there and Ms. Sassnack consoled me and she didn't really know what to do, but she kind of left me there to gather my thoughts. And so that kind of set the tone for, for school. Um, difficult situations um, with friends, doing presentations, in classrooms, at the playground. Um, fear, guilt, shame, embarrassment, everything that we're accustomed to in the, with the Southern Iceberg, I felt. And maybe neglect is a harsh word, but maybe my teachers didn't know about what to do then. I stuttered, but at the same time, I was mild. And at that time, I was also trying to hide it. So maybe I was good enough to, you know, pass through the system and not get stuttering therapy through the school district. And so when I bring up the fact that uh, I'm a second generation Filipino American, that means my parents, they immigrated here from the Philippines. So English was their second language. They were disadvantaged with an accent. They didn't have the educational background or resources to really understand what stuttering was or to um, figure out the best, the best way for me to go about it. And at the same time, if you're a kid of Asian parents, or it could be any country really, if you're here in the US, the goal here is to assimilate and to become successful and to capitalize on opportunities that they didn't have. And so couple that with being an only child, my parents, I don't know, their success or their hopes and dreams are all built on me. That's, that's a lot of weight to carry. So high expectations is one, not being accepted, uh, school, home, church, family, friends. On the outside, maybe they did, but on the inside, I didn't accept myself yet because I felt different. And that meant I was alone. And I was alone for 30 years because I never met anyone else who stuttered for 30 years. So environment, every single situation you grow up in, the whole world that you know is negative. You don't know anybody. Your SLPs have told, have told you and your parents that you can't get speech therapy. So what the heck are you supposed to do? The only way that I could confront this was to become covert. And so when I started becoming covert, even at an early age, when I figured it out, it was the direct opposite. When I was covert, usually that means to me, you know, hiding my speech disfluencies, appearing as fluent, right? That's, that's typically what we mean by it. And so I felt included. I was, it was easier to fit in social circles, participate in conversations. I was rewarded. I got better grades. I didn't get dinged for participation anymore. Uh, I saw that. I got better opportunities uh, with friends. Um, as I got older, I was able to gain more responsibility at work, get, mon get more money with raises. I attributed that to my speech, made my parents happier uh, by accomplishing what they wanted me to, to do, which was to go to college and graduate. I also felt hidden in a good way because I didn't get the attention that stutterers normally get. I use first person identity, so, so bear with me. But 
it's, it's awkward and it sucks when, when you get the attention as you stutter, right? We all, we all feel that way. We all feel the shame. We all feel the embarrassment. I wanted to get rid of that. I also felt privileged. I felt privileged as I learned later on, I grew up in a community where it was predominantly Asian, black and Mexican. And so when I went to college and started meeting more people, I realized people were starting to talk differently to me based on, well, I'm not short, but I'm five, six and I'm also brown. And so I wanted to make sure that they knew that I could understand English, I could speak it well. And I just, I didn't want to get, I just wanted the same opportunities that other people got. I, didn't, I never wanted to be excluded as I was when I was a kid for showing my stutter. I felt more efficient, faster in conversations. I felt the effort I was putting in was worth it because it didn't take, it took a lot over time to, to grow and to perfect, or maybe not perfect or to hone, but at the same time, I was able to weave through people, whoever I needed to speak to. I was able to spend more time on other things. And at the same time, I felt happier about myself, just being more, more effective in, in doing other stuff. And being Kofor also led me to feeling accepted. Acceptance for me, not really from anybody else, because I felt that by the time I was 29, because of the way that I handled my stutter, I was able to accomplish what I, what I already wanted to do. Key milestones, like getting married, buying a house, but also traveling, which is something I'd never thought I'd do. Um, I got on a, a plane when I was first 19 and I never, I only thought I was only gonna get on a plane for maybe two or three times in my life. And I've been on much for many more times after that. But I've all attributed that back to, to being a covert stutterer. That's just how I knew how to handle it. And maybe it's different for everybody, but that was it for me. And so when it came to family and friends, many never saw me stutter, or at least that I knew of. A few uh, close family members said that they actually saw me stutter after I asked them directly when I went to the conference last year. And some friends never suspected anything um, and friends that I had known for decades. And so leading that to my wife is also on here. Thanks for supporting me, Dorothy. While dating, my wife only saw glimpses of my stutter as well. And usually whenever she saw glimpses, they were negative. And so when we moved in together, what she didn't realize is that my stuttering is actually 10 or 20 times worse at home. So it's weird talking to you guys here because I'm at home, but I'm like, I should be out talking to you guys in public. So it's kind of like a weird situation. But uh, what I've been working on at home is while I've reached that acceptance of, and when I mean acceptance, I mean, if I stutter, it is what it is. I, it doesn't get me down at that moment. It doesn't ruin my day. But what I realized is that for her, because I, I don't express that, I've, try, I've tried to be more proactive in pointing it out, acknowledging it, letting her know how I feel and profiling it, profiling it because I want to understand like, was I mad? Was I happy? Was it, did it just happen randomly? Um, all of our speech patterns are completely different. My parents, we, we didn't talk about stuttering for about two decades as well. And so after the conference, I actually got a chance to sit down and talk with them. And they were surprised that I actually went to a stuttering conference and they were surprised that I, that I still stuttered, even if it was as a covert. And so there, we actually had a pretty good discussion about it because they realized that it didn't hold me back. Um, maybe I accomplished things and not exactly how they visioned, but I was able to get around and support myself. And so they ended up coming around. And the best part for this new set of friends was meeting all the new friends in the stuttering community. For 30 years, I was alone. I didn't know anybody. And I remember walking into my first meeting September 2018. That'll be next two years next month. And it's funny because in this community, when Kathy talked about feeling at home, that's actually what I felt. I've never felt the, leave, the need to leave San Diego. And so when I came back from Fort Lauderdale from the conference, I actually questioned whether I should live here or not, which is the first time I've ever encountered that in my life. That's, that's the amount of impact that community had. I had already accepted my, my stuttering for what it was, but I realized that there was a lot of healing to do revisiting traumatic experiences as a, as a stutterer, even embarking on new things like potentially rewriting history of what was the last moment I could recall out of school when I stuttered. And so for all of you here that I haven't, that I've met and that I haven't met yet, 
I wish I had met all of you a lot earlier, but maybe I wasn't ready to. But that's why we're having this discussion today because we need to understand what covert stuttering is. We need to realize that people may be getting overlooked and we can't ever let this happen moving forward. There's too much at stake. There's too much that people have to deal with and speech is only one element of our lives, only one facet. So I've got a couple more things to share. I'm still covert. I'm happily being covert. Um, it's what I've been doing ever since I was seven, minus that three year break. And the only difference now is that I, I am, I do feel safe disclosing. If it's in a safe stuttering space, just like this, if I'm on a panel with kids that I see my seven year old self in, letting them see my stutter, I feel safe even then too. I, I don't feel comfortable sharing showing my stutter. I just don't feel it's a natural thing, but that's just my way of handling it. And on social media, I don't care. I mean, all my friends are like stuttering uh, friends now. And so there's no reason to hide that community, but even covert people will even go that length that hiding themselves from social media. So it's different for all of us. But the reason why I choose to be covert and to handle my stuttering as is, is because when I went to the conference last year and at my local chapter, this past year, I met two other people who also took the same approach with their stutter. They didn't meet anybody else when they were growing up. All they had to do was, or all, their goal was just to be covert all the time. And I never heard them stutter once. And we were able to connect. And not only were we able to connect, but we were able to stay in the community. And so I feel like if you see anybody who's similar to me or similar to the two other people that I described, you've got a connection or a gateway to point those people towards. And that's why it's important for me to get in front and be an advocate for covert stuttering, to spread awareness, to bring understanding to it. Because it shouldn't be taboo. In the stuttering community, covert, amongst other things, can be seen as taboo. It can be seen as something where you're forced to transition from covert to overt. It can be seen in a way in which covert stutterers are not seen as stutterers. Well, we're gonna address, I'm gonna address some of those myths right now. Covert people who stutter, you are stutterers. You belong. There's no inauthentic way to stutter. We don't see ourselves above or below other people. That's not what we're here for. We're here to find healing with, our, with both our visible and below the surface iceberg, just as all of you have. Our stories and our experiences are valid. And I want you to know that being covert is okay. It's a choice. And you have the right to exercise your choices. And so whether you're covert, whether you're a person who stutters, whether you're a supporter, whatever, it's your choice. And no one can ever take that choice away from you. And if you ever feel like your choices aren't working out for you, well, guess what? You've got people to ask, people to guide you in the right direction. And if you need a covert SLP, well, you've got two on board who are gonna take us right into Q&A right now. So thank you.